Presbyterian, uh, <clears throat> we're looking at uh, Matthew Windsor's article against the onomy, and this is uh, a critique of the critique number five, number five. And uh, we're going to continue, and I'm going to read from Math, uh, Matthew chapter five on the, the great, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> now we were considering, we're in the midst of considering his position on the judicial laws of Israel, and his position is one of radical discontinuity, and his position is one that every judicial law, all the laws outside of the Ten Commandments are positive. That is, they uh, are not moral laws, they're not perpetual laws, they're positive laws. And he's trying to be consistent. He wants to say that the whole, when the confession says that the judicial law is expired, he wants to be consistent. And he interprets that as every judicial law has expired within the judicial code. The only way to do that, the only way to say that they're not perpetual is to say that they're positive. And we've shown that that position, driven to its logical absurdity, makes no sense whatsoever. And we thoroughly refuted his position, but we do have some more things to, to say. Now the point, we were considering the point about how do you know? How does a civil magistrate know what sin is it just a sin and what sin also is a crime? And our position is, is if you don't have the judicial case laws, the moral laws in the judicial code, there's no way to distinguish that. It becomes up to the civil magistrate to decide and then uh, you really slide into statism. This point is important. For a professing Christian, Christian civil magistrate starts putting in place absurd status laws, a man guilty of lust or improper thoughts, the thought police, you know, they make that a crime. He admits to a friend that he, he has had improper thoughts and the friend reports him to the police. He gets arrested. You laugh at that, but that could happen in Nazi Germany. That could happen in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> you might spend a year in a slave labor camp. Anyone caught stealing will face a firing squad. Okay, if the, if the penalties, if the, the penalties attached to the laws are completely arbitrary and positive, why not? Why not have a firing squad for theft? Those who have adopted Windsor's position have no real or substantial biblical ammunition to oppose a status ruler who wants to do those kind of things. They really don't. Winter's position has no real or substantial biblical ammunition to oppose him. They can appeal to natural law, but without the specific of God's moral case laws, which are perspicuous, the debate over the legitimacy of certain laws will quickly degenerate into a ruler's version or interpretation of natural law versus the opposition's. For example, today, we all say, Christians, homosexuality is obviously against natural law. It's obviously unnatural. Okay, it's an exit. It's not an entrance. It's, it's not meant to be used for what they're using it for. But Obama doesn't see it that way. Hillary Clinton doesn't see it that way. They think it's perfectly natural and wonderful. They think it's, they think it's ethical. It's virtuous to do these things. That's the way they talk about it anyway. <clears throat> Since the ruler controls the police, the military, and the big guns, his position will always win the day. We need the rule of law. And the rule of law means ruled by biblical law. It means ruled by specific law. It means ruled by revealed law. <clears throat> Without the law of God's distinction between sins that are sins and sins that are crimes punishable by the state, on what basis does Windsor argue against modern hate speech legislation? Hate speech legislation. You already have hate speech legislation in Canada and most of Europe, places 
probably Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's coming quickly in the United States. They keep wanting to adopt it. Uh, and so people who say something against homosexuality can be arrested and fined or put in jail. How do you oppose that? If no appeal can be made to the judicial laws, does he accept that such laws are proper? If not, does he appeal to some philosophy outside of scripture, such as libertarianism? Windsor unweedingly removes one of the Christian's greatest weapons against secular humanism and the idea that man is his own God determining for himself what is good and what is evil. He's unwittingly supporting what's going on in the world today, where secular humanism is running rampant, where the, sec the secular state wants to control every aspect of our lives. In addition, his position suffers from an incredible arrogance, for it presupposes that fallen man can flesh out and apply the Ten Commandments in as good or better a manner than Jehovah himself, <clears throat> speaking in his inspired and fallible word. Now, anybody familiar with even pretty solid Reformed Christians who's familiar with going to presbytery meetings and, and synod meetings, I'm talking about like in the OPC or the PCA or the RPCNA, um, the more you see, the more you see men do judicial things, the more you see how even Christian men need to be restrained by the clear teaching of God's word. They need it. Because men, being sinners and fallen, do stupid things. Even Christian men do stupid things. <clears throat> if one thinks that I am overstating my case and driving Windsor's position to its logical absurdity, keep in mind that he describes his own position on the confession as one of radical discontinuity. Regarding 19.4 and the law of God, he writes, quote, and this is from page 68, the explicit proposition of the confession together with the obvious meaning of the scripture proofs leads to the conclusion that the confession teaches a hermeneutic of radical discontinuity with respect to the Old Testament judicial laws. Although the confession qualifies this proposition to provide for an element of continuity in the general equity of these laws, the fact remains that the laws themselves are considered to have been discontinued as a result of the expansion of the covenant of grace to include nations other than Israel. End of quote. Now, since we've examined to a, a, to a degree the implications of this position of radical discontinuity, let us pause for a moment and consider some of the proof texts from 19.4 that according to Winds, Windsor obviously support his position. Okay, we're going to look at just briefly 1 Peter 2 and then we're going to spend some time on, on uh, Matthew 5. That'll, that'll cover the rest of today. Because the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm not talking about the part that Bonson spent so much time on, but the, the application of the law by Jesus completely shreds any idea that the whole judicial law has been abrogated or expired, excuse me. <clears throat> in 1 Peter 2, 13 to 14, we read, these are proof texts from the, the uh, Confession of Faith 19.4 in the law. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So Peter tells Christians living in a heathen state, Paul does the same in Romans 13, very similar passage, to submit to the laws of the land. By this command, does he mean every law, even laws that contradict the law of God? And the answer is no, obviously not. There are laws in every nation that, are lar that largely correspond to special revelation due to natural law or the work of the law written upon the heart, Romans 2.15. For example, law, most nations, virtually every nation, has laws against stealing, murder, homosexuality, kidnapping, and adultery. We should submit to the laws of the land we're living in. Be at peace with all men as, as best as possible. But what about a law requiring an, op, uh, an offering to Caesar as a god? <clears throat> 
or a law forbidding the public preaching of the gospel, or a law requiring monthly service at the local abortion clinic. In such circumstances, we must obey God rather than men. Okay, so the, the, the passage in Peter, and also Romans 13, it's not a blank check to the civil magistrate to do whatever he wants. Obviously, if you're living in a pagan nation, you have to submit to the laws unless they contradict scripture and require you to sin. It does not contradict theonomy one iota, and I could give you tons of statements by Rush, Duny, and Bonson that fully comport with what I've just said. This passage proves that we are not under Israel as a body politic, but does not forbid attempts by Christians to pass modern legislation based on Old Testament moral laws outside of the Ten Commandments. Laws against homosexuality, bestiality, incest, sorcery, idolatry, witchcraft. And we'll have to talk about the penalties later, but the question is how just do you want to be? The average penalty for second degree murder in, in Western nations is 15 years in prison. I saw a documentary about uh, a beheading of a young girl in uh, Australia in 1980. The man beat her with a club, knocked her out. She would have been fine if he had called the ambulance. He, got, he lost his temper. He wanted to have sex with her, and she said no. He beat her with a club, knocked her out, and then he went back to the bar and got drunk. He came back, and he thought she was dead, but she wasn't dead. He just knocked her out. So then he grabbed a big giant wrench. This is a true story. Uh, he grabbed a big wrench, and then he slammed her in the head with the wrench. And he thought that killed her. And then he came back, and she was still alive. Then he choked her to death. Then he cut off her head, and he chopped off her fingers, and he threw her off a cliff. This happened in Australia. It was a very, a very famous case in Australia. Uh, he got, he was convicted. There was tons of evidence. He had a very unique blood type. He, she, he was convicted. There was tons of evidence. And guess what? He spent 15 years in prison and he, he was let out. On what basis are you going to say that that's wrong? Now, what most people will do will say, well, yeah, but murder is also condemned outside the Ten Commandments in uh, Genesis 9 with Noah. But what about bestiality? What about homosexuality? You're going to determine the penalties arbitrarily. Paul says that civil magistrates are ministers of God. They receive their authority from him and are responsible to punish evil as defined by God and reward the good as defined by God. Okay, that limits the civil magistrate. Imagine Obama punishing people that he didn't like, that made him angry, instead of following God's law. It'd be like having Joe Stalin around. The confession also appeals to Matthew 5, 17, 38, and 39. This is where we're going to have a, a digression for quite a bit on the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. And then the confession has 38 to 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheeks, turn to him, on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now what we're going to do is we're going to accept Windsor's interpretation of Matthew 5, 17, which is a common view. And then I'm going to show that if you accept Windsor's own position on Matthew 5, 17, it still completely proves the enemy and disproves his position. A very common interpretation of Matthew 5, 17 is that since Jesus is discussing, uh, Jesus discusses teaching and doing God's law in the New Covenant administration, and then goes on to defend a series of moral laws in verses 21 to 44, that Matthew 5, 17 and following only has in view the moral law. It's a very common view. Okay, that differs from Bonson, which believes it had, what Bonson does is he says it applies to everything but then it applies to the ceremonial law in a different way. And it applies to positivistic laws and the judicial law in a different way. If you say it just applies to the moral laws, well then you avoid 
Bonson's position where you have to have this exhaustive, the law in exhaustive detail and have to take everything a lot back later on. It's easier to defend this position. Uh, here's John Gill. Quote by the, on this passage, by the law is meant the moral law, as appears from the whole discourse following. This he came not to destroy, or a loose man's obligations to, as a rule of walk and conversation, but to fulfill it, which he did doctrinally by setting for it forth fully and giving the true sense and meaning of it, and practically by yielding perfect obedience to all its commands. Exposition of the New Testament, volume 1, page 44. Matthew Poole essentially concurs. Quote, it is manifest by his following discourse that he principally speaks of the moral law, though he also fulfilled the ceremonial law by being the antitype in whom all the types of that had their complement and real fulfilling and accomplishing. Commentary of the whole Bible, 322. Windsor has endorsed this interpretation and remarked that it was the interpretation of the Puritans. Uh, it was one there were two major interpretations among the Puritans and expositors. One is the one we've just read by Poole and by Gill. Another interpretation has similarities with Bonson's in that fulfill is used in a different sense. Jesus fulfills prophecy in one way. He fulfills the ceremonial law in another way. He fulfills the moral law in another way. It's very, in the end, it has a very similar teaching to Greg Bonson, but it's different in that Bonson wants to restrict the word to confirm, where fulfill is a broader term and it makes it more consistent with talking about fulfilling prophecy and so forth. And I believe that's Matthew Henry's position. <clears throat> And of course, this view, even people who hold that it's only the moral law, this view that I've just gave comes out in uh, many of the applications of the passage. Prosai is given a very broad interpretation. Although they interpret Plerao in a different manner than Bonson, their final conclusions are very similar. That's why I say, if you, I disagree with Bonson's interpretation of Matthew 5.17. I don't agree with it. But his conclusions are orthodox and very similar to what the Puritans taught if we're fair to him, if we look at how he qualifies things. That is why Bonson can quote Calvin and others in support of his interpretation. The important thing to keep in mind is that once Windsor adopts the common moral law only position, he has reviewed his own contention that the moral law is only the Ten Commandments, and that's what we're going to prove. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is you can adopt Bonson's position, you can completely reject Bonson's position and accept the other position that he's only talking about the moral law. And even if you adopt that position, in fact, if you do adopt that position, it proves the theonomic position very strongly, irrefutably, in fact. Okay, one does not have to accept Bonson's interpretation of Matthew 5.17 to be a theonomist. This raises the question. If we accept the position that Jesus is only upholding and defending the moral law, does this passage disprove theonomy? And the answer is no, it actually supports it. And it, it, it supports it irrefutably. Irrefutably. The only person who believes it disproved theonomy would be someone who comes to the text with the presupposition that the moral law is only the Ten Commandments, that the moral law is not summarily comprehended in the Decalogue, and that appears to be Windsor's position. If we carefully examine Matthew 5, 19 to 44, we'll see that our Lord's own view on Christians as doers and teachers of the moral law. That's what he's talking about. Christians as doers and teachers of the moral law. The message of the Sermon on the Mount, if you study Reformed expositors, is primarily to Christians. It's primarily to disciples. Now, it's, it has an evangelistic element because there's other people there that are not as disciples. It's, it's to a large crowd. But it's primarily teaching us what is the New Testament way to live and think. Verses 19 to 20 <clears throat> forms an introduction to the section which follows where the Savior gives example after example of how he upholds the moral law in the opposition, in his opposition to the scribes and Pharisees who have perverted the law. They've reduced it. That Jesus Christ is only discussing the moral law can be inferred from the fact that he is discussing how 
he upholds the moral law in his teaching. And he is describing how the moral law is to be obeyed by his disciples. His correctives to the Jewish perversions of the moral law in his day apply to the new covenant era that he is about to introduce. And what I'm saying now, what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes or so, all of it is accepted by Reformed expositors. This, I'm not teaching anything unusual. The Redeemer discusses both teaching and doing after the cross. You can read John Stott. You can read Martin Lloyd-Jones. You can read John Brown. Uh, you can read uh, a number of Reformed commentators. They all teach this. <clears throat> Christians are not to keep the ceremonial laws or any positive laws of the judicial code. That much is clear. That Jesus is discussing the moral law is proved by our Lord's statement about the consequences of keeping or breaking a least commandment in verse 19. Look, you guys, you have to obey the whole law. Even least commandments. Now, it is noteworthy, I just, this is a side note, it is noteworthy that to a first century Jew, none of the Ten Commandments were regarded as least commandments. None of them were in the moral law. The common view, at least by the second century among rabbis, was that the least commandment was the requirement to let a, mother, a wild mother bird go when one takes its eggs, Deuteronomy 22, 6-7. Look at the Talmud, you look at early sources, that's the common view among Jews. That's the least law. God teaches, and, and the greatest moral law, according to the Jews, regarding the second table, was uh, respect to parents. That was, they considered that the greatest law, respect to parents. God teaches that a disregard of animal life or actions, that endanger a species of animals, even birds, is immoral. Okay? You don't go out and slaughter the buffalo. You don't go out and indiscriminately shoot things. If you're going to take the eggs, let the mother live so the mother can lay more eggs. That's what God says. Now, if you believe that's just positive law, you can take the eggs and the bird, and you can just set it on the ground and stamp on it with your boot. But according to God, that's immoral. A person's obedience toward and teaching on the moral law as defined by Christ will determine their position in the Savior's kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying. In addition, the laws that our Lord vigorously upholds and defends will not pass away till heaven and earth pass away, verse 18. This refers to the distant future when Christ returns and ushers in the final stage and the new heavens and the new earth. Until that time arrives, however, nothing whatsoever uh, will remain lacking as to fulfillment. God's program with respect to Christ, the church, mankind in general, and the universe will be carried out in full. Isaiah 40, verse 8. And I think that passage supports the Puritan interpretation that we should take fulfill in a broad way and apply it to prophecy and apply it to the ceremonial laws and everything. Kind of what Bonson does, but it's a more consistent position. He fulfills the ceremonial law by dying on the cross and ending it. In that sense, bringing it, it's, it's not that he abrogates it, it's just that it's no longer necessary, and so forth. Moreover, note that the Savior precedes his teaching on the moral law by stating that his disciples' righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, verse 20. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is I'm establishing the fact that in the introduction to the teaching that follows, we're not talking about positive laws, we're talking about moral laws. Jesus is telling the disciples, how to uphold the least commandments in your teaching and how to uphold all the commandments in your doing. And then he goes on to refute the scribes and Pharisees' position and 20 and following, 21 and following. The scribes and Pharisees were not righteous because they perverted the meaning of the moral law in order to make it comport with their human traditions and make it easier to keep. Okay, if you're a legalist, this is the same thing with the Auburn Avenue heresy or the Federal Vision heresy. If you're going to hold to the position that, well, God requires covenant faithfulness, uh, their definition of covenant faithfulness, and obedience to the law of God in order to be justified at the final day, <clears throat> they reduce the law. You reduce the law so it's easier to keep. 
They perverted and reduced the, its full meaning to make it support their legalistic concepts of justification and sanctification. <clears throat> this also proves that the teaching in verses 21 to 44 applies to the New Covenant era. Okay, now everything I've said thus far is accepted by Reformed expositors, old and new. It's only dispensationalists that want to limit this to the Jews. They limit it to the Jews then or to the revived Jewish nation during the tribulation. But it doesn't apply to Christians, which are a parenthesis in God's plan. That's nonsense. Now, having demonstrated that in verses 21 to 44, Jesus is defending the moral law and that this law is binding on all as a rule of life during the new covenant era, we need to see how our Lord, def our Lord defined this moral law, which is perpetually binding. Okay, so we're not going to the confession of faith here. We're going to go see what Jesus says. And what Jesus says has priority over what anyone says because Jesus is God. He doesn't make mistakes. Does the Redeemer restrict the moral law to the Ten Commandments? Which is Windsor's position. We just read his position on the radical hermeneutical <clears throat> separation. Oh, what, what was the word? Discontinuity. Or does Jesus also apply it to what Theonomists refer to as moral case laws? That is the moral statutes and regulations outside the Decalogue that explain and apply each commandment to persons, families, churches, and societies. Does Jesus restrict himself to an exposition of the Ten Commandments, or does Jesus discuss laws outside of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament that explain the Ten Commandments, they, that flesh it out? If it can be demonstrated that our Lord referred to the laws outside the Ten Commandments that were part of Israel's judicial law, or the Mosaic law in general, then Windsor's position has been refuted by Jesus Christ himself. Okay, so you see the importance of this. In our Lord's teaching on the true meaning of God's moral law versus the Jewish traditions, he sets forth six antitheses. Each contains a contrast introduced by the formula with minor variations. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, followed by, <clears throat> but I say unto you. The expressions, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, or it has been said, we find this 21, 27, 33, and then 31, is never used by Jesus when referring to the, to the whole, Holy Scriptures. So you've got to get this dispensational slash evangelical interpretation out of your mind that Jesus is putting down the Old Testament law and setting up a new, better law, a higher ethic. That's not what's happening. He's refuting the Jewish and false interpretation of the law. <clears throat> when the Redeemer quoted from the Bible or the Mosaic law, he would say, it is written... Gegraptai, meaning literally, it stands written. For example, Matthew 4, 4, and 7, Luke 2, 23, and 4, 4, etc. If he was referring only to the law, he would sometimes say, Moses commanded, Matthew 8, 4. The statement, it was said of them of old time, by them of old time, or to those of old, the New King James, you can translate it either way, refers to the teachings of the rabbis of antiquity. Okay, it refers to the teachings of the rabbis of antiquity. That is, the so-called fathers of antiquity. The Jewish audience to whom Jesus was speaking would have immediately understood the statement to be a reference to the scribal traditions. Now, I don't have time to go into detail at length, but the, the Jewish doctrine of tradition is very similar to Roman Catholicism. They believe that when God gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, God also gave Moses a bunch of oral stuff that helps explain the law, and that these are what's being hashed out over time by the rabbis. Now, this view that Jesus is not refuting the law itself, but the scribal traditions, is confirmed in the contrast themselves where the teachings Jesus is refuting and correcting clearly have nothing to do with the real meaning of the inscripturated Old Testament laws. <clears throat> In general, the Jewish religious establishment was trying to reduce the challenge of the moral laws or relax the rigor and full meaning of the commandments so the commandments would be less exacting enough to fit in their, into their paradigm of legalism. <clears throat> 
For example, and we'll, we'll get into this, but thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, there's a lot of men that have never touched another woman other than their wife. There's lots of them. There was even, there's even pagan men that have done that. But Jesus says, how many of you have never had lust in your heart? How many of you have never, how many of you have never had impure thoughts? And then, of course, the, the side point there is Jesus wants them to know that they're sinners and they need him. But Jesus is showing the law is, you know, you can't just restrict it to one thing. We'll get into that in a second. <clears throat> in each of the antithesis, Christ introduces the correct doctrine with a statement, but I say to you, 22, 28, 32, 34, 39, and 44. <clears throat> this statement is crucial to this whole section because the formula points us to the unparalleled authority of the Son of God. He speaks with an authority infinitely greater than the religious teachers of Israel. For he is the theanthropic mediator, the God-man. And remember, the people marveled. No, we've never heard anyone speak with authority like this. Well, he could speak that way because he was God. <laughs> He, he was not just a prophet, and he certainly was not some corrupt religious leader. He was God. Jehovah incarnate, the very giver of the law himself, was now correcting the erroneous interpretations, conclusions, and additions to his own law. Therefore, if Jesus says that moral case laws outside of the Ten Commandments bind us in the New Covenant era, we must accept what he says without exception or equivocation. I'm giving you absolute, 100%, undeniable proof that Windsor's wrong, that the theonomy position is correct. So pay attention. In the first antithesis, our Lord focuses his attention on the scribes and Pharisees' understanding of the sixth commandment. The statement, you shall not murder, this is verse 21, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment by itself, does not sound that bad. The statement seems to be the sixth commandment combined with an allusion to Deuteronomy 35.30, which says whoever kills a person shall be put to death by the, on the testimony of witnesses. However, in Jesus' discussion of the scribal interpretations, we see that the scribes and Pharisees were restricting the meaning and application of this commandment to the external deed of homicide alone. In other words, the only people who were guilty of committing murder were those who actually went out and killed somebody. And we're talking about murder in the full sense of the term. Thus, according to this view, as long as we have not stabbed, shot, or beaten our neighbor to death, then we have perfectly obeyed this commandment. In fact, if this is our view, then we could say that violations of the sixth commandment are indeed very rare. Not very many people go out and kill people. There's not a lot of murderers out there. Jesus then goes on to explain that the sixth commandment also forbids unjust anger, hatred of bitterness, and hurling insults at another person, verse 22. Our Lord insists that in cases where a brother has something against another, or is experiencing inner anger or resentment toward a brother, he must approach his brother and confront him nuthetically in order to achieve reconciliation. That is, he goes to the brother and he applies scripture. Look, man, you called me this, or you did this. That's wrong. This is why. This is what you need to do so we can have reconciliation, etc. Christ internalizes the Ten Commandments and teaches that the violation of the commandments begins in the heart. Our Lord accepts the scribes and, uh, expects the scribes and Pharisees to know this. And he chides them for their external understanding of the law. This raises the question, why does the Savior expect the religious establishment to understand the Sixth Commandment in this comprehensive manner? Were they supposed to know this from a careful study of natural law? No, remember the context. Jesus is discussing the moral law. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. This teaching comes from the moral case laws. 
For example, in Leviticus 19, 16 to 18, we read, You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Instead of hatred, gossip, and meddling with a neighbor with a tongue, one must throw away the dagger of inner hatred and speak to the person face to face to achieve reconciliation and stop oneself and the other person from sinning. So Jesus isn't here just simply making up new teaching out of thin air. He's getting this from the Old Testament and he expects the religious teachers of his day to understand this. Once again, we must keep in mind that Jesus is not giving new teaching that opposes or adds to the moral law. He is setting forth the true and full meaning of the commandments and thus upholding the whole expression of the moral law. In the third antithesis, Jesus corrects the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees on the moral case law regarding divorce. Here he continues his teaching on the proper interpretation and application of the seventh command. Instead of dealing with lust, which is a sin of the heart, he corrects a sinful deed, the divorcing of a wife for any cause. Most of the religious establishment interpreted Deuteronomy 24, 1-4 as permitting easy divorce. Easy divorce. It all boils down to one's interpretation of the expression from Deuteronomy 24, 1, found some uncleanness in her. Many interpreted the word uncleanness, debar, as referring to anything that, that the man found undesirable. Well, he's, she's a bad cook. She burnt my toast. She's fat. She's got, she's got a lot of, put a lot of weight on. She's old now. She doesn't look very good anymore. I find something I don't like about her, but I can get a new wife. That is the way they interpreted that law. Our Lord corrected this false interpretation of this moral case law by noting the erwat debar, some indecency or some uncleanness, refers to fornication or adultery. A study of Deuteronomy 24.1 and the uh, expression, some uncleanness, um, proves this. Although the precise meaning of the phrase erwat debar, translated as some indecency or some uncleanness or something indecent is difficult, it refers to sexual perversion or adultery for the following reasons. So what is Jesus doing here? All he's doing is, is he's saying, you've got, you've got this moral case law wrong. Here's what it means. And it applies, by the way, to my disciples in the New Covenant era. First, the phrase literally means nakedness of a thing or a naked matter. The word uncleanness of a thing definitely implies a serious offense. It is used elsewhere of the shameful exposure of the body. Genesis 9, 22, Exodus 20, 26, Lamentations 1, 8, Ezekiel 16, 36, and 37. In Leviticus 18, of illicit and abnormal sexual practices. And in Deuteronomy 23, 14, for human excrement. Thus, this term would be perfect for describing sexual immorality in general. It would be an inappropriate expression to describe not being able to bear children or to designate a non-sexual offense. Second, the term nakedness is used as a metaphor for sexual intercourse 23 times in Leviticus 18 alone, which deals specifically with forbidden sexual relationships. Indeed, this chapter is a catalog of sexual sins. Third, the language used in Deuteronomy 24.4, defiled, clearly suggests a sexual offense of some kind. Remember what Paul says in Corinthians? Hey man, what are you guys doing fornicating? What are you guys doing having sex with prostitutes? He said it's worse than other sins because it's a sin against your own body because you become one flesh with her. You're defiling yourself. It's disgusting. What are you doing? Four. <clears throat> if Deuteronomy is allowing divorce for only a serious sexual violation on the part of the wife, then we have a complete harmony between God's law and the Redeemer's exception clause in Matthew 5.32 and 19.9. 
This point is important when we consider the fact that our Lord is not refuting, correcting, or adding to the law in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember that. He's not refuting it. He's not refuting God's law. He's not correcting God's law. He's not adding to God's law. He's explaining the true meaning of God's law in opposition to the scribes and Pharisees. He's giving <clears throat> the true meaning against scribal perversions. Therefore, Deuteronomy 24.1 does not justify divorce for any cause, which is the teaching for Christians. Those who reject the view that sexual immorality or adultery were in mind do so on the basis that adultery was a death penalty offense. Thus, they argue that the death penalty rendered divorce in such circumstances unnecessary. The problem with this view, which is common, is that it does not take into account that there are instances when adultery is known to have taken place but cannot be proved in a court of law. Remember, you need two witnesses. You need pretty good evidence to convict somebody. Jewish courts needed two or three witnesses to get a conviction, and this was not always easy. For example, the woman caught in adultery in John 8 could not have been lawfully convicted under biblical law because the witnesses were corrupt, unqualified, and thus disqualified, John 8, 7 to 8. Further, <clears throat> it seems that in the case of, the, uh, of adultery, the death penalty, according to the Mosaic law, was the maximum penalty under the law. Proverbs 6.35, remember the book of Proverbs is Solomon's inspired application of the Ten Commandments to society. Proverbs 6.35 speaks of the husband who refuses mo monetary recompense from the man who committed adultery with his wife. In other words, he insists that the man must be executed. And there is the case of godly Joseph, who after discovering Mary was pregnant and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Matthew 1.18. Deuteronomy 24.1 teaches that a man who knows that his wife is committing adultery and, but does not have sufficient evidence for a civil trial or does not want to go through a trial is free to divorce his unfaithful wife. However, once he does so, if she chooses a course of habitual adultery by marrying another man, he can never take her back. She is defiled before God. Now, the whole point in discussing the third antithesis is that in Jesus' teaching, we have here indisputable proof that Jesus upheld an Old Testament moral case law in the judicial code, and he applied it to the new covenant kingdom of God. Okay, divorce is not an ecclesiastical matter. It's primarily a civil matter. Now, obviously, a woman who's committing adultery would need to be dealt with by the church, but she'd need to be dealt with by the state as well if the man presses charges and so forth. <clears throat> so let us summarize our reasoning so that those who stubbornly hold to a Ten Commandments position, only a Ten Commandments only position will not miss it. So let's note the following observations. First, we noted that many Puritans, Reformed expositors, and Windsor himself holds to the position that Matthew 5.17 refers to the Savior's fulfilling of the moral law. Okay, and I could quote commentator after commentary that adheres to that position. Second, and that's, man, that's the position Windsor apparently endorses. Second, we saw that the Redeemer's teaching in Matthew 5.17 and following applies to the New Covenant era. This is the standard interpretation by the Puritans and Reformed expositors. Only dispensationalists don't like that position. Dispensationalists look at what Jesus teaches it here and they say, we, don't, we can't accept this or we're going to have to abandon dispensationalism. So they arbitrarily assign it to the Jews only. Third, we discuss the fact that our Lord is not setting forth a new or different ethic than the Old Testament for the, such a view would explicitly contradict the context. Jesus did not come to abrogate, annul, or replace the Old Testament moral law, but fulfill it. So if you take the position, yeah, Jesus is getting rid of the Old Testament law and setting up a new law. First of all, the scribes and Pharisees who knew the Old Testament better than the vast majority of Christians would have called him on the carpet immediately and accused him of actually annulling the law. That's not what he's doing. Fourth. We demonstrated that Christ's refutation of the scribes and Pharisees' reduction of the Sixth Commandment presupposes that the Sixth Commandment is further defined, explained, or fleshed out by the moral case laws relating to murder. We also noted that the third antithesis, our Lord refutes an erroneous interpretation of Leviticus 
This point is acknowledged by all, all reformed expositors. If the Savior defends the correct view of Leviticus 24.1 and following, which is a moral case law in the judicial code, while he is discussing how his own disciples' righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, then, then, he is upholding a specific moral case law in conjunction with Matthew 5.17. The Ten Commandments' only position has been refuted by Jesus Christ himself. You see that? The only way to get around that is to say, well, you have to adopt the dispensational view that Jesus has teaching here for the Jewish kingdom. The church is a parenthesis. It doesn't apply to the church. It only applies to the Jewish kingdom, which will happen during the, the uh, tribulation in the millennium. In addition, the idea that all the judicial laws without exception have expired, but we may be able to learn a few general principles from these expired non-binding positive laws is also refuted. In the third antithesis, our Lord is not arguing about general principles. You know, these non-specific, vague principles. We might be able to glean something out of this. But over the meaning of one Hebrew word. The whole debate came down to how you interpreted one Hebrew word. Does the word refer to fornication, sexual immorality, adultery, or does it refer to anything the husband finds unseemly? I'm getting rid of my wife. She did not iron my pants effectively. I'm getting rid of my wife. She's overweight. I'm getting rid of my wife. She's old and has gray hair. No. It has to be sexual immorality. He was defending the specific teaching of Leviticus 24.1 so that his disciples' righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who had watered down and perverted the meaning of this one word. And they were like men today, pagan men. They get to middle age, they trade in their wife, they get a younger wife. They were doing exactly what pagan men do today. Christians don't do that. People who follow Jesus' word don't do that. And the law of God don't do that. In the fourth antithesis, Matthew 5, 30, uh, 33 to 37, Jesus defends moral case laws in the judicial code relating to oaths. <clears throat> See Exodus 22, 10 and 11, Leviticus 6, 3, Numbers 5, 11, 28. Oaths were used in civil courts, cases of suspicion of adultery, and are certainly implied in the marriage covenant, the sacraments, and church membership. The taking of oaths is related both to the third and ninth commandments. The third commandment, because you have to use the Lord's name when you take an oath, you swear to God, and if you're taking an oath falsely or, or with the wrong motive, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. And then, of course, if you don't keep your oath, you're a liar with a superadded obligation. The scribes and Pharisees had attached different arbitrary formulas to oaths so their promises could later be broken. Our Lord counters by essentially teaching, do not make these kind of oaths at all. That is the phony oaths of the rabbis. Christians are to be totally honest and not make oaths over trivial matters. According to the context, our Lord was correcting the scribes and Pharisees' perversion of the moral law in the Mosaic law, not natural law. So Jesus, once again, is defending laws outside of the Ten Commandments. Therefore, the laws relating to oaths in the judicial code are moral and apply to the New Covenant era. Once again, Dispensationalists are aware that the Sermon on the Mount contradicts their position. I'd like to see how Windsor deals with this. So classical dispensationalists arbitrarily assign Jesus' teaching to the Jewish expression of the kingdom, but not the church. Windsor seems to be unaware that it explicitly contradicts his position. I'd like to see how he can deal with this. Now, according to the classical dispensationalist view, the, the Sermon on the Mount is not directed to the Christians or to the Church of Christ at all. 
which is a parenthesis in God's plan, but rather to the Jews only and those living in the future Jewish theocratic kingdom during the coming millennium. It is argued that this sermon presupposes the doctrine of repentance, which old-style dispensationists argue is a distinctly Jewish or legal doctrine. Oh, that terrible doctrine. You're not allowed to sin anymore. <laughs> you have to try to be holy. They argue that the dispensation of grace is unconditional and thus repentance is a requirement, as a requirement is contrary to the Christian faith. In support of this idea, they point to the petition in the Lord's Prayer, which says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. They argue that this prayer must be for the kingdom age and not the church because it rests upon personal obedience or a legal ground. That's not what's going on. That's a false interpretation. Thus, old-fashioned dispensationalists do not use the Lord's Prayer in private or public worship at all. Now, here's what the old Schofield Reference Bible says. Under law, forgiveness is conditioned upon a like spirit in us. Under grace, we are forgiven for Christ's sake and exhorted to forgive because we have been forgiven. That's page 1002. That's complete and utter nonsense. If you don't forgive somebody, it's simply evidence you're not regenerate. You're not forgiven because you forgive somebody. <clears throat> One dispensationalist author has written that, quote, the so-called Lord's Prayer is a prayer that has no place in the Christian church than the thunders of Sinai or the offerings of Leviticus, end of quote. So the dispensationalist teaches that the Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with us, therefore it can be ignored. And they're being consistent. They have to. If you say the Old Testament law has been abrogated, it has nothing to do with us, you have to take that position. The fifth antithesis, antithesis which gives us Christ's teaching on personal retaliation, is used as a proof text of the Confession's teaching on the civil magistrate 19.4. Now, I am not sure why it is used, but let us assume for a moment that some of the divines believe that it was a good proof text that some of the penalties or the general teaching of the lex talionis, that's a Latin phrase meaning law of retaliation, has expired, had expired. That's possible. If that is why this passage is referenced, we need to ask ourselves, is that a legitimate or a biblical interpretation of the section of the Sermon on the Mount? Now, the English word, just, just a note here, the English word retaliate originated from the same, same Roman root word for talionis. Unfortunately, now you've got to keep this in mind, unfortunately, the modern usage of the word retaliation is more narrow than the old English word the old English usage, and retaliation is now only associated with revenge, getting even, or returning evil for evil. Thus, many scholars and commentators and pastors view the principle of lex talionis as primitive and barbaric. But according to the earlier usage of the word, it conveyed a broader meaning to pay back or return in kind, including goodwill. The point of the statute was simply that the penalty must fit the crime. The penalty must fit the crime, that justice must be applied in the same manner to all. The Jews had taken a law for the judges of Israel, had illegitimately applied it to personal vendettas, and were not applying the principle equally to all. They perverted the original intent of this law in virtually every possible way. So, is this a legitimate text? to prove that Jesus is abrogating the law of the lex talionis, which really mean you really should look at that as the penalty must fit the crime. Is Jesus getting rid of that in favor of a more compassionate, gentler penalty? Or is Jesus refuting a perversion? The answer is that Jesus is not, absolutely not, abrogating anything related to the judicial law here. In this antithesis, the Savior turns his attention to another abuse of a, ju of a judicial law. As the Jews at that time were abusing the moral case laws regarding murder, okay, they didn't take into account hatred, inner murder, or verbal murder, Divorce and oaths, they had also misconstrued the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth principle regarding restitution and civil penalties. 
They had taken a just law. And remember, Deuteronomy 4, 7 to 8 says, 7 to 9, says that these laws are just. That the penalty must fit the crime. That the penalty must be applied in criminal cases under the direct supervision of the civil magistrate, the judges of Israel. And they had made it a justification for carrying out personal revenge and vendettas against those who had offended them. Okay, if, somebody, if you're out chopping wood and your, your neighbor accidentally chops your hand off, that doesn't mean that you can go grab the axe and chase him into the woods and go chop his hand off. It means you've got to take him to court and meet with the judges, and he's got to come up with a, a recompense, a monetary recompense. Okay, the idea that he just goes and chops his hand off, uh, that, that would happen extremely rarely. It, he would get a, a, they would agree on a penalty determined by the judges. <clears throat> As we examine this section of the Sermon on the Mount, we need to remind ourselves that in this passage, Jesus is not announcing a higher standard of ethics or jurisprudence than Moses. He is not introducing something new which is more spiritual and merciful than was required under the Old Covenant administration. That's not what's going on here. <clears throat> Rather, once again, he is correcting a gross, false interpretation and abuse of the original intent of God's holy law. Here's what Arthur Pink says, quote, he continues the same course as he had followed in the context, namely to define that righteousness demanded of his followers, which was more excellent than the one taught and practiced by the scribes and Pharisees. And this he does by exposing their error and expounding <coughs> the spirituality of the moral law, end of quote. Now it would be irrational and a gross violation of context to have Jesus say, look, I've, I haven't come to abrogate the law, but I am now abrogating a portion of it and replacing it with my own law, with a new law, with new teaching. Remember also that our Lord is telling the disciples how their righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Verse 20. The Savior does not have an axe to grind against the Mosaic Law or the Moral Case Laws or the Ten Commandments that he wrote and instituted himself. He is correcting human perversions of the law. How are the scribes and Pharisees twisting the Lex Talionis and thus violating God's law? As noted, they were using a biblical law that God gave <clears throat> for civil courts Deut uh, see Deuteronomy 19, 17 to 18, where the parties in the dispute stand before the priests and judges who are in the office in those days. They were using it as a biblical proof text to exact personal retribution. Okay, so-and-so said something bad about me, so that gives me an opportunity to go gossip myself. So-and-so hit me in the face. That gives me, uh, I can hit him with a baseball bat, etc. <clears throat> the Lex Talionis was put in place to establish justice in peniology. It was put in place to make sure that the Jews followed justice in peniology. It was designed to make sure a proper, just, or equitable punishment was meted out by the authorities that fit the crime. It restrained the victim or family members who were likely full of wrath. Your son gets killed or something. From imposing their own arbitrarily penalty, which due to anger and a desire for revenge would be out of proportion to the crime. The judges, after considering all the evidence, would determine the appropriate penalty and restitution in, con in consultation with the victims or victim. It also restrained the civil magistrate so that officers of the state do not overstep their authority and impose sanctions that are unjust, either too lenient or too harsh. They took the law of just retribution and equitable restitution and turned it into a tool to get even. Personal vengeance. Many Jews believe that this law gave them the insight, the right, and even the duty to punch someone in the face who had slapped them. <clears throat> Thus, the very law designed to completely remove personal vendettas from society had been turned upside down by the rabbis. <clears throat> 
What was supposed to bring justice and order had been twisted to justify personal violence and disorder. Now, we've run out of time. We'll have to continue this next week. But I want to point out to you, Jesus is telling his church, follow this judicial law. If you want to be righteous, more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, don't follow their perversion of this law. Jesus is specifically, explicitly applying a judicial law to the new covenant church that is moral or just. The Windsors of this world are wrong. The Ten Commandments position, only position, is wrong. And we'll have to continue this next week. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for your law. We thank you that Jesus Christ upheld the moral law, including the least of commandments, including commandments that are outside the Ten Commandments that are moral in content, that help us understand and apply the Ten Commandments better. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for Jesus' teaching. We pray, Lord, that you will cause those who profess to be reformed, who hate your judicial law, who oppose your judicial law, who oppose your moral laws within the judicial code, that they would repent and obey Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. In Jesus' name, amen.